Um, what I wanted to talk about today is um, really not theoretical um, or theoretically based. My interest is uh, in the history of spiritualism and in the production of uh, ectoplasm. But I'm also very interested in a specific medium um, by the name of Mina Crandon, but I always pronounce her name Mina Crandon, so just bear with me. I'm going to be pronouncing her name that way throughout. <laughs> uh, and I'm not going to be talking about her ectoplasm, um, uh, for what it's worth, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, for what it's worth, though, I mean, that has been really the focus of any um, investigation of Amina Crandon. Um, and, and for what it's worth, also, her name, her stage name, her nom de séance was Marjorie the Medium. She didn't come up with that herself. She was given that name. Um, as far as the way that she's been characterized in the past, she has been presented as this vamp. I actually went to um, New York um, to see the girl who handcuffed Houdini, um, and a character existed that was based on Marjorie, and it was basically a burlesque show. And it was like the, um, the most, uh, I don't know, superficial understanding of this particular character. And so what I want to do is actually tell people more about who uh, Mina Crandon was and um, how complex and interesting she really was beyond the ectoplasm. So, here we go. Um, Mina Stinson was a farmer's daughter born in 1889 in a small town near Toronto, Canada. She eventually moved to Boston's venerable Beacon Hill where she lived with her second husband, Leroy G. Crandon, a wealthy Harvard surgeon. Um, Mina entered the world of spiritualist mediumship quite by accident. In 1923, Mina's husband, an ambitious and avowedly skeptical man, became obsessed, and he converted. After reading On the Threshold of the Unseen by Sir William Barrett, a psychical researcher, and, like Crandon himself, a man of science, the doctor became interested in the possibility of survival of human personality after death, which was... Um, something that really uh, inspired a lot of research in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Um, Barrett, a physicist and a fellow of the Royal Society, believed the medium to be indispensable in the transmission of information between the spiritual and physical worlds. He likened her role to that of ponderable matter, physical mass necessary to reveal the waves that vibrated through luminiferous ether, his words. If unseen forces could only be known by their action on matter, the imperceptible was something that required a mortal lens. In addition to Barrett's study, Crandon also read The Psychic Structures of the Gallagher Circle by an Irish engineer named William Jackson Crawford. And for what it's worth, as far as ectoplasm was concerned, it seemed to attract all sorts of scientists, from um, physicists to psychoanalysts to engineers. Um, Crawford had spent the better part of four years analyzing ectoplasmic projections produced by a young Irish medium named Kathleen Gallagher. Photographs of these sittings show a flaccid gauzy strip, what Crawford described as a psychic rod, slipping from between the seated medium's thighs and pooling at her feet. Ever the engineer, Crawford theorized that Gallagher and the mediums like her tipped tables, and this is something that was very common at the time, tipping tables was like how this all began in a way, um, by producing ectoplasmic cantilevers. So the rods sprouted from the medium's genitals, wandered to the floor, then angled back up to bump against the underside of the table, and after that it was showtime. Uh, Crandon's reading, um, so I mean we've already got this sort of phenomenon and the, and the potential for that there. Crandon's reading introduced him to two ideas that would eventually become central features of the Beacon Hill seances. First, that the imponderable spirit world could take the form of physical mass, and second, that ectoplasm might be seen as a physical medium's messy progeny. For psychical researchers like Albert von Schenk-Natzing and Gustav Gehle, uh, the ectoplasm-producing medium had given birth to a biological fact. This was absolutely how they interpreted this. Yet, the evolution of the seance room spirit seemed inevitable. Since the medium deciphered the spirit world, it made sense that she would eventually give it form. The almost magical potential of such ideas is certainly reflected in a letter to the editor of the New York Times published in 1923, the year of Crandon's conversion. 
The author, a self-help writer by the name of T. Sharper Nolson, describes ectoplasm as, quote, a manifestation of the creative energy which gradually <laughs> changes a fetus into a child. Um, and, and trust me, there's so many more analogs like that. Um, according to Nolson and the researchers who crafted theories to account for this evolution, the medium, like the, like the mother, quote, does not consciously perform the miracle of child formation, end quote. Reprodu reproduction of this sort was an unconscious process. However, the seance room performance became an emphatically <coughs> conscious creative act. When her husband installed a table like the one Kathleen Gallagher tipped for Crawford in their upstairs den, Mina was amused. It seemed that Crandon's enthusiasm for the new science of spirits had grown overnight. Before books on spiritualism began to crowd Crandon's already densely packed shelves, he had been a vocal materialist, skeptical of the Victorian spiritualist fad that had by the 1920s acquired mainstream respectability. Crandon seemed an unlikely ally and an advocate of the movement. This began to change after he attended a 1920 lecture by Sir Oliver Lodge, an esteemed British physicist who was touring the U.S. to promote the faith and to encourage objective inquiry of it. Um, Lodge himself became a convert to spiritualism after encountering in a seance the ghost of Raymond, a beloved son who had died in the Great War. Lodge's revelations and his conversion puzzled Crandon. Neither fit into any pattern that Crandon had pre previously known about scientists. Nevertheless, Lodge and Crandon became friends. The fourth floor den of the Crandon's Lime Street house was converted into a seance room, and Mina soon became a medium. The first seance took place in May of 1923. Mina and Crandon had gathered together a circle of friends who sat in silence and waited for the table to stir. Again, Mina was amused. In one of the few interviews she granted, Mina later recalled the scene and the seriousness with which the sitters regarded that table. Quote, they were all so solemn about it that I couldn't help laughing. End quote. Eventually, and despite Mina's characteristic levity, the table bucked, reared up on two legs, and then fell to the floor with a bang. This was the first shot. Eager to find out who among them was responsible, members of the group took turns leaving the circle. The table still gambled about like a curious horse. It only stopped when Mina left the circle. This was the beginning of Mina's life as, quote, the witch of Lime Street, and, uh, Lime Street, end quote, and what one researcher would call the most remarkable mediumship hitherto recorded. Like her husband's growing interest in the world of seances and psychical research, Mina's mediumship seemed to sprout overnight, a mushroom born in the seance room murk. Crandon was easy to promote, or eager to promote his wife's newfound talents and wrote to any prominent researcher or writer sympathetic to the spiritualist cause. Two months after the first seance, Crandon penned a letter to Walter Franklin Pierce, a research officer and editor at the American Society for Psychical Research. Prince, sorry, that should be Prince, uh, a one-time clergyman who nursed more than passing interest in multiple personality disorder was one of the ASPR's most down-to-earth investigators. He was skeptical of physical mediums and their phenomena, and as a self-taught conjurer, and most of these um, psychical researchers were, was well aware of their tricks. But as far as Crandon was concerned, Prince was an expert who might have a professional interest in their amateur home circle. So Crandon made his appeal by telling Prince about a June seance in which Walter, the seance personality and purported ghost of Mina's <coughs> deceased older brother, appeared. Instead of describing his wife's talents as a medium, however, Crandon tells Prince of the, quote, unusual psychic powers, end quote, her brother demonstrated while still living. He also tells of Walter's boyhood interest in telegraphy and telephony. All of these details serve to explain Walter's post-mortem communications. His wife, whose sisterly affection strengthened her role as a conduit, was a merely a bit player, at least in Crandon's rendering. Crandon concludes the letter by inviting Prince on an expenses-paid trip to Boston to see these wonders for himself, but the wonders were just beginning. In the meantime, Crandon pursued other potential sponsors, including Arthur Conan Doyle, creative creator of Sherlock Holmes, and a Latter-day Evangelist for the Spiritualist Movement. In fact, um, 
Conan Doyle believed that his work in spiritualism was far more important than anything he had written um, about Holmes. Um, Doyle was in the middle of a North American tour and responded to Crandon from a Canadian train and in shaky script. He encouraged Crandon in his endeavors and advised him to listen to the manifesting spirit who had already made such an impressive debut. But he also warned him about the dangers of trance and urged him to avoid the, quote, degenerate skeptics at the ASPR. Because for Conan Doyle, most skeptics, whether they be degenerates or not, were fundamentally untrustworthy. And, and I mean, it, it was like sort of a, a reasonable expectation at the time. <laughs> Mina's first performance outside the Crandon home circle took place in July of 1923 in front of a group of academic men from Harvard. The investigation team was headed by William McDougall, chair of a Harvard's psychology department, and a man who would later help establish J.B. Ryan's parapsychology laboratory at Duke University. McDougall was joined by Gardner Murphy, a much younger psychologist who was studying telepathy. The last member of the group, Harry Helson, a promising PhD candidate whose interest in gestalt psychology was comparatively mundane. Phenomena during these sittings included automatic writing, the content of which was purportedly beyond Mina's training or knowledge. While in trance, she wrote messages in Chinese, Italian, French, and German. Most of the messages imparted fortune cookie wisdom. For example, before every man there stands a picture of that which he is to be. And so long as he falls short of this, he is not at peace with himself. End quote. Or terse introductions. The great General Ken Yuen is here, end quote. <laughs> According to Walter, the room was positively teeming with garrulous ghosts that seemed to think he had a dozen tongues. For McDougall, Walter offered a special me message from the other side. He told the professor that he was highly regarded in the spirit world and that he wished to serve him. But despite this cordial exchange and the spirit world's exhaustive demonstrations, the Harvard team remained unconvinced. Walter's messages then changed form. He no longer offered multilingual scrawls, instead he whispered. He also destroyed the medium's cabinet, which was um, this sort of makeshift, uh, well, cabinet, where the medium sought to, to like kind of generate and um, intensify her psychic powers. Um, he destroyed this cabinet, which was a pointed act of rebellion to be sure, and the group returned several months later for a final seance. At the, after the Victorola began to play, and this had become standard practice since Walter believed that music put all sitters, whether skeptics or sympathizers, at ease, the group watched as a stool tipped and skittered along the floor, keeping time with the music. It then slid eight feet in a straight line. At least Helson claimed the chair followed a direct path. Crandon argued that it moved in a more graceful arc. The point <laughs> of contention was important. After scouring the floor for a clue that would explain the chair's little expedition, Helson fixed his gaze on a string that had unraveled from the rug. He pocketed the evidence, and the group bid the Crandons goodbye. Helson was certain the string tied to the chair had been pulled across the floor by a hidden confederate or somebody helping um, with the seance. A few days later, Crandon opened a letter from McDougall in which the psychologist gently laid out his case for fraud. Crandon had the choice of telling Mina of the verdict or of having McDougall do it. He did both. <laughs> After relaying the contents of the letter to Mina, he sent her to McDougall's office for a friendly battle of wits. When she arrived, McDougall attempted to extract a confession. Mina was unmoved. He finally put Helson's evidence on the desk, and Mina was amused. She was also incredulous. After witnessing hours of ghostly messages in different tongues, a cabinet wrecked by unseen hands, and a dancing chair, this was all the esteemed researchers had to debunk her. Mina could hardly contain her laughter, and McDougall sat in his chair. This episode, though, would neither end her nor Walter. Instead, both would perform for countless scientists, psychical researchers, and spiritualists. Both would also engage in, and eventually win, in the short term, a very public battle of wits with the great escape artist Harry Houdini. And by 1926, Mina would become the brightest star in the spiritualist firmament. Yet, in spite of all their, of their high regard for the medium and her supernormal abilities, Mina supporters never regarded Walter as an entity that the medium herself had a hand in fashioning. Of course, this isn't surprising. 
Such an admission would violate spiritualist articles of faith that position the medium as a gifted but passive vessel through which the spirit is communicated. As for Mina's sometimes well-meaning critics, her persuasive performance has concealed a troubled psyche or a split personality. In this essay, I offer an alternate reading of Mina and Walter, her most compelling and serviceable creation. Unfortunately, though, our view of Mina is limited by the nature of the available archive. There are a few documents through which we may see the uh, medium emerge as a complete person. What letters exist are often between her husband, Leroy Crandon, and psychical researchers and fellow spiritualists. So if we are to rely upon these letters alone, we might see Mina as a mere vessel, a trilby, who performed under her husband's direction. But such a portrait negates Mina's role as a creator. Her ectoplasmic creations, and there were many, and they were remarkable, were crude next to the masterful reanimation of her brother, a ghostly presence that charmed even the most obdurate of her observers. Walter, as she reimagined him, was a fully developed character. In fact, American novelist Hamlin Garland described Walter's larger-than-life personality accordingly. Quote, he presented himself as a youth, humorous, powerful, impudent, and testy. He ordered us about like children. He assumed the tone of a master as though by the, as though by the mere act of dying he had become possessed of all the wisdom of Lodge and Edison. And yet he busied himself with tricks to astonish us like a boy of 12, end quote. He also taught science with engineers, poetry with English professors, and theology with preachers. He seemed to have a very remarkably wide range of knowledge. But Walter was a spectral creation that also served a very real, a real world purpose. He allowed Mina to engage in conversation with educated men and women. He endowed her with intellectual and spiritual authority. And given her husband's infatuation with spiritualism, he may have also helped her secure a future for John, a son from her previous marriage. Finally, her recreation of her brother's ghost likely provided comfort to Mina's mother, a frequent sitter at the Boston seance, um, seances. Regardless of her motivation, it seems like Mina was more in control of her creation than the psychical researchers and spiritualists of the period would care to admit. On June 1, 1926, parapsychologists Louisa and J.B. Ryan visited the Crandons to observe a sitting. They went as believers, they left as skeptics. The medium, presumably under Walter's direction, performed a range of supernatural acts. He correct, correctly identified wood, um, a wooden series of well, a series of wooden letters, tossing them from the cabinet once he had identified them. He correctly identified objects that had been collected from each of the sitters. He waved a megaphone, rang a bell that was enclosed in a box, and tipped a balance with an ectoplasmic arm. The Rhines, calling the practice of mediumship the sister art of magic described these feats as though they were magic acts, and the Rhines did believe that they were acts. In a controversial article in which they assessed the performance, the Rhines concluded that the seance was premeditated and brazen trickery. At the end of the article, and perhaps as sad for their stinging criticism of the medium, they provided a possible motivation for Mina and her performances, claiming that her husband's fear of death gave Mina a practical way to secure both her marriage and a future for her son. After she had garnered praise and admiration for her performances, and after her husband had embraced his role as both stage manager and crusader for the spiritualist cause, the termination of these performances was out of the question. They had to go on, and they did. The Rhine's disappointment in the seance also is understandable. They were in search of genuine phenomena, and they saw what they believed were stage acts in the Boston drawing room. But their observations of Walter and Walter's banner reveal something about the medium herself and the ways in which the dead were expected to perform. Walter whistled in joke. His remarks, the Rhines noted, were clever and inappropriate, and he excused his sister's failure to identify a pair of items that were in the basket. The division between Mina and Walter, the spectral entertainer, was imperceptible, though. His defense of his sister was Mina's defense of herself. At the conclusion of the seance, Walter recited the Lord's Prayer in German and then told all of those gathered to go to hell. Um, and, and she actually did this quite often, or Walter did this quite often. Oddly enough, the sitters responded with a burst of applause, and uh, Crandon proudly claimed that Mina knew no, no German in many ways. It was this purported lack of knowledge that sustained the medium's reputation as a gifted seer. In an, interviewer that, uh, an interview that appeared in the May 1926 edition of, or issue of Collier's Magazine, Mina tells the interviewer, 
Those who insist that I am Walter honor me overmuch. Anne recounts her friend's astonishment at the association. Her friend said, I am sure they would not accuse you of knowing so much if they knew how really dumb you were. <laughs> <laughs> Mina was far from dumb. Um, and Mina's own wit is very much in evidence in that interview, um, as it is in Walter's interactions with various sitters. Um, in describing his own assessment of Mina's manifestations, Arthur Russell, or sorry, Francis Russell described Walter as a, quote, kind of pool room Johnny from the other world, end quote, <laughs> whose creation would have been too demanding a feat for the unentranced medium. Perhaps in testament to Mina's capabilities as a performer, Russell himself, along with other skeptical observers, took Walter at face value. He may have been a trans phantom, but for Russell, Walter was a complete individual. He never hesitated, never lacked for words, never stepped out of character. In 1928, Robert J. Tilliard, a researcher best known for his work as an entomologist, visited the Crandons in order to experience the Walter phenomena for himself. Um, instead of metamorphosis, um, what Tilliard witnessed and later wrote about in an article for Nature was another nudge at the material world from the ever-adaptable Walter. At Oliver Lodge's urging, Crandon agreed to let Tilliard conjure Walter in a private consulting room and away from the familiar settings of the Crandon Lime Street den. And after dipping the tips of his spirit hands into warm cur wax, Walter gave the researchers yet another bit of evidence that confirmed the truth of his existence. These were fingerprints from the other side. The material evidence used to identify criminals was now used to uh, confirm the identity of a ghost. And during this process, Walter <coughs> lost neither tactile sensitivity, complaining about the hotness of the water several times, nor his libidinal wit, who's the charming blonde, he asked, about Dr. X's assistant. <laughs> He was actually, um, yeah, very um, off color most of the time. Um, Walter's fingerprint impressions later discovered to be those of a living person, the Crandon's dentist, no less, and his ectoplasmic productions, as far as Tilliard was concerned, were not nearly as impressive as his personality. Tilliard believed that Walter was independent um, of that of the medium by the possession of a distinct masculine voice, strong whistling powers, um, and these never proceeded from the mouth or larynx of the medium, um, by his alert mental powers, tendency to impatience, and the use of swear words um, by a marked sense of humor, a Canadian accent, I'm almost done now, <laughs> and many other qualities uh, which cannot fail to produce in a sitter the definite feeling that he is dealing with an independent personality. Indeed, even Mina's sharpest critics seem to be at once charmed and puzzled by Mina's, Mina's seance from character. And Walter made the most of this confusion. He openly chastised them. He made jokes at their expense. But he reserved his most pointed attacks for Crandon, her husband, and his well-heeled friends. As Beth Robertson notes, if, quote, if the medium could not express her own class identity and frustrations, and remember, she comes from a small farming community in Canada, um, oh, well, I love this. Walter had the freedom to do so. During a seance, Walter recited some poetry, which was not recorded, closing with the remark, quote, that I got digging sewers, end quote. His voice at this point became louder, it gets better actually, um, and huskier, um, and distinctly vocal as he added, quote, you are all snobs, the street cleaner, the sewer digger, the kitchen worker may be more spiritual than the white-collared person who is so sure that he's God's representative. When, in the next life, you find yourself slipping down the sluggy slides of the cliff, you may be glad of the helping hand of the more spiritual street cleaner. The domestic in your kitchen may be an old and tired soul. Some of you are certainly fresh souls. If this was the sister art of magic, it was one in which the magician enacted her will to perform more than just illusions defying her examiners, her followers, her critics, and her husband, and ultimately defying death, Mina Crandon reinvented her life. 